Hey guys, Joe Pye here at Advanced Innovations in Austin, Texas. Welcome back to my shop. You know, I got an inquiry recently from a subscriber that asked me for a how-to solution to something that he was going to do. He needed to turn a round journal on the end of a square part. Boom, right? No big deal. Well, this one is a little bit different. It wasn't necessarily the center line of the journal was not true to the body of the part. So looking at it from the side, This was the question right there, which I thought was really quite a coincidence because if you're following my cannon build and you know anything about these 12 and 6 pound artillery guns, the wheels are not perpendicular to the axle. They're skewed. So this exact situation is something that I'm going to be confronted with coming up here in the very near future and I know how to do it. So I gave them one suggestion. I'm going to show you two different ways to do it. I'm going to do one in the lathe and I'm going to do one on the mill. The mill technique is called back boring and if anybody else, any of the other YouTubers have covered this, forgive me, uh, it's a very self-explanatory method. It's a method by which you turn the boring bar with the cutting edge to the inside of the track and you come down with it and you actually turn positive round features on a milling machine. It's pretty cool if you've never seen it done, you're about to see it done. So let's take a walk out, I'll show you the lathe solution first. Then we'll jump over to the mill, do the opposite side of the part. Let's take a walk. This is the workpiece for today's demonstration. It is one inch square 6061 aluminum. This is about four inches long. And the challenge is to put a journal on the end at an angle to the center line of the part. My solution for that is to grab another piece of material split it at the angle that you want to achieve on your workpiece and then use that to create parallel surfaces so you can go back to the fore jaw and put it in the fore jaw and do it. Now I think you can see by looking at the reference from this line right here to the bottom which will be the face of one of the four jaws by sliding this in or out of the setup will influence the height of your part. Now that could be relatively tricky to try to indicate and uh, you know as I stand here right now if I had to do this I would probably do it make it longer and put a tooling ball in the end and indicate the tooling ball to achieve my height but then you'd have to start this job in a mill and for those of you that don't know what a tooling ball is put that in the comment line because that's a video that's coming up and I just like to know how many people are uh, gonna tune in Anyway, I've got index marks on this for the setup, and the setup is going to take a minute or two in the forge jaw. Let me move the camera over, and we'll turn the journal on this and show you how nice this works. Okay, we are looking at this from the operator side, and you can see how well this is going to work. If I had any recommendations, it would be that your support block is a little thinner than your actual material, so that when your opposing jaws come down, on the opposite sides that you're not biting onto the wedge that you're actually biting onto your part. And this is seriously ugly but as soon as this cleans up and you get a turn journal on that this is going to look pretty cool. So let me put the camera around the back of the machine, fire this thing up and turn something around on the end of that. Stay tuned. Alright let's make some chips. You are going to have a serious interrupted cut to start with. So I would say to be a little more delicate with your feed rate until you have a continuous diameter or more surface contact instead of the hammering that it's going to take initially. Let's see what we get.
Let's take it out, take a look. Okay, there you go. And I'll tell you, it was a really timely question because that's exactly what I have to do to the axles on my cannon. Not sure that I really want to because it's going to look like it's worn out. But it's, uh, as far as being authentic is concerned, that's the way to do it. Now let's take it over to the mill. I'm just going to draw a circle on the end of this and mill it by hand and then we'll back bore the final diameter. Maybe we'll just do it this way so it looks cool. Alright, hit the mill. Now the setup for this particular operation is going to be done with the part squeezed in the vise this way. And I am going to use one of the original angle blocks from the four jaw setup to establish the angle on the other side. Now I'm sure there's more than one person out there that's been caught by this. When you go and you try to use a specific block to clamp your part and the block is as large as the workpiece, that can be very frustrating. I always use two blocks. Now it doesn't matter. Now let's squeeze these together. I want to make sure that the good block is registered on the ground section of the vise, that the workpiece is centered, and that the slave block that I'm using is only engaging the workpiece and not the clamping material. And I will disengage this camera just to show you exactly what I'm talking about. This one, two, three block is only hitting my part. None of the supporting gear in there is trapped in the setup. That's a good way to have a piece pulled out of the machine. If you're clamping down on one of your helper blocks, and the cutter hits that, you're going to know pretty quick you made a mistake. All right, let's mill the top of this block off, draw a circle on it, back bore it around. I'm going to mill the majority of this material away by hand. And if you'll notice, I'm going to go in a clockwise rotation with the cut, which results in a climb cut to the cutter itself. And the reason for that is so that all the burrs are forced in from the edge. And it'll, it'll result in a lot cleaner edge with a whole lot less to deburr. If I were to mill in a counterclockwise rotation, the rotation of the cutter would force all the chips to the outside of the part and result in an edge with a much more aggressive burr. Let's move that off center, draw a circle on it, remove the majority of the material. I can assure you that that looks better from where I'm standing than it does on that camera lens. That's yeah, pretty bad on that camera. Size of that circle. 
the camera is right where I would put my head for some of the other features and it's really hard to see them. Close enough. Stick the boring bar in there. Finish it up. Okay, with the boring bar reversed in the head, let me throw the machine into neutral so you can see what I'm doing. Here's the setup. Instead of the cutting edge facing out, cutting edge is facing in. The very first thing that I'm going to do is to adjust the height of it against one of these back corners. Set a stop on the machine so I don't grind the tool into the part as I'm coming down. I'll get very close as not to chip the tool. Set my stop. If you did have an XY location set, now would be the time to go back to it. I'm going to keep the cutter just above the part. And I'm going to eyeball the diameter that it's cutting. Yeah, I'm going to get an Allen wrench I can use. Okay. I think that's probably a good place to start. I think that's a very good place to start. This is going to end up in a nice clean boss on there. And this technique, forget the shake guys, it's, I can see that. It's a very large extension on this camera and the slightest bump. There you go, knocks it around. Okay, let's get back in gear. A little bit of snug on the quill so it doesn't have a tendency to dig, jump around, reject, bounce, whatever you call it where you're from. And make sure that you turn the machine on in the correct rotation with the tool flipped around like that. You may actually have to put the machine in reverse, which is what I'm going to have to do. a relatively clean diameter I'm very pleased with that I'm going to put a uh, finish cut on that couple thou deep and when I get down I hope the camera doesn't go out of focus for this of course it will thank you very much let's refocus that for you okay if you look very closely you can see the remnant plateau left over from the hand milling to the back boring operation when I come down here with the machine with the quill I'm going to come down and I'm going to hit that with the stop on the quill and I'm going to stop feeding with the quill and I'm going to come up with the table. I have a lot more control that way and I'm going to look for the blend. So let's take another couple of thou off of this for a cleanup cut and see if we can get down and clean up this surface without this tool screaming all over the place.
face of this tool is rather healthy and it is not ground as I suggested inside it is dead flat and it's only because it's a brand new tool and I just didn't want to ruin it just for one demo but it, ideally you should have just about a sixteenth of an inch worth of land if you're going to do this and in your initial roughing of the boss try to get as close as you can if you don't have a camera in your eye and you can turn the lights on you should be in good shape well, let's pop this on the bench take a look okay guys let's talk about the final product you can see by using the same block that I use in the four jaws the one in the mill that these center lines are probably parallel that's an illusion huh look at that okay and the difference in the finish here I did hit this with a scotch bright wheel just to clean up any superficial uglies but whenever you have a tremendous load on your tool and I took 450 off of this this is 450 deep with a 3 8 cutter and I did not use a cleanup cut on the bottom so you can rest assured that there's some deflection in your tool and that the surface finish that you're going to get is not optimum leave a couple of thou for cleanup and go back around it and you'll get a much nicer blend at the end I did not want to come down real hard with the finish boring bar that I used on this and that was sent down here from Joe up in New York so thanks for the bar Joe it works out pretty good but there you go you need to turn an angle and naturally this particular technique is governed by the length of the part and the severity of the angle if the length of the part is too long it's not going to uh, get down inside your spindle so it's probably going to have to be done on an angle plate backboard the way I just showed you strapped to an angle plate and that's what I call a zero deflection setup that's a topic for another day but it's coming okay guys I hope you like the two different ways to do that No big deal. Thanks for watching. All right, well, I hope that you enjoyed that. There are many ways to do the same job. And, you know, I've always said if you put 10 guys in a room to do one job, you'll come up with nine different solutions, so long as the end result is the same. Uh, and safety is a factor to be considered, of course, that it's nice to have all these different opinions on how things are done. Those are two. One of the things you want to consider when you back bore is if you have a positive cylindrical feature on any type of part, try to remove as much of the material surrounding that as you can. And when you grind your tool, make sure that whatever land you have on your tool is sufficient to clean up the surface around that positive projection, but you don't want it completely flat because you have a nice small bite as you're coming down with the boring head. And when the bottom hits, this big surface contact takes over and it's going to give you just a rah, it's going to ruin your day, probably ruin the part. So little land, back relief, do your turning, and uh, just be gentle, creep up on that bottom flat surface. I hope you like what you saw, I hope you can use it, and if you've seen it before, sorry about that, I don't get a chance to watch everybody's material, but someday it's going to overlap. Anyway, thanks for watching, Joe Pye, Advanced Innovations, Austin, Texas. I'm out.